All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Astronomy on Tap. This is our first ever live stream for Astronomy on Tap BCS. Welcome. This is new to us. It is also new to you. It is new to everyone. Hooray. OK. Um, so if you've uh, been to one of our events before, usually what we do is kind of like go through trivia at the beginning. Um, we're still going to do trivia, but uh, it's all going to be online. So if you go to this link, um, tx.ag slash AOT trivia, uh, you can fill out the trivia in a Google form and uh, make sure you enter your email there because that's how we will get prizes to you at the end. Um, I'm going to quickly plug all of our social media. Please follow us on Twitter, on Facebook and Instagram. We're AOTBCS. Um, you can also find information about events at astronomyontap.org. Um, check us out. Follow us. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube because we have a YouTube channel now. That's exciting. Hooray. OK. Um, yeah. Oh, that's what the next slide said. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so please like, please subscribe. Uh, um, also, you can help out uh, the venue that normally supports us, the Grand Stafford. Um, they are uh, still, uh, they, they can't host any events right now, but they still exist. And so it'd be great if we can support our local businesses. Um, so the best way to do that is to Venmo Jose Quintana um, 20. Uh, so this is the owner of the venue. And if you put Stafford tip in the description, uh, they will know what it is for and why you are sending them money and everything will be great. Um, but please support them. They've been amazing hosts for us. Uh, that, that is how we can tip our bartenders tonight. Yeah, uh, as we say at every event, tip your bartender and please continue to tip your bartender. Yes. Um, and then you can also tip us if you like us and like what we're doing. Um, you can support us by donating uh, at AOTBCS on the Cash App or on Venmo. Uh, we do have t-shirts. Uh, we will have to work out how to get those to you right now, uh, but that is something we can potentially do for the future. Um, and in the meantime, any little bit helps. We're starving grad students, please help us. Maybe not that bad, but we do appreciate all your support. Our next event, last, last announcement before we get started, our next event is going to be May 20th, 2020. So that's the third Wednesday of every month. Um, and it will also be live streamed just like this one. So uh, we look forward to seeing you then as well. Um, but first up uh, this month, we have our first speaker uh, for, for this month is going to be Silvana Delgado. So she is a uh, first year graduate student um, researching some of the most massive black holes in the universe. Uh, some of her mm -hmm. passions include extreme sports, dancing, playing the ukulele, and traveling to new places and to her home country of Ecuador. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my own screen and welcome uh, Sylvie or Blue Moon Skater Girl to share hers. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen now. Hello. Um, so I'm drinking Blue Moon because my name is Blue Moon Skater Girl now. Um, I'm really excited to be here with everyone today. I'm kind of sad that I'm not able to do this in person, but um, I'm, I'm happy to have an audience that isn't just College Station. So if there's anyone from Ecuador, welcome. Um, and, and yeah, so uh, today I'm gonna be talking to you about one of the coolest things in the universe or something that I find is the absolute coolest thing and that's the force of gravity. And if you have any further questions after this talk, um, feel free to follow me at cosmic underscore Sylvie on Instagram or Twitter. Um, and you can ask me any questions you want. So let's get started. Okay, so this is gonna be a drinking game. So some of the rules are, this is AOT after all. So some of the rules are drink every time you hear the word gravity and drink every time Albert Einstein or Sir Isaac Newton is mentioned. And if you don't have a drink already, grab a beer or grab some wine, or if you're like my cousin Fernando, grab some tequila. And then please, please take this lightly, take small sips um, because I am gonna say the G word a lot. So just keep that in mind and cheers. 
Okay. So let's get started. So we've heard about the curvature of space time. You might have heard about Newton's apple. You've heard about black holes and you've seen pictures of the universe. But what do all of these things have in common? Gravity is actually working there. And um, sorry about that. So, but what is gravity? Do we have an understanding of what it is? Um, maybe not. So my motivation here today is to explain to you this phenomenon and hopefully give you a better understanding of why it's so important in our universe and um, to, for you to be able to explain it to other people and think about it in your everyday life because it does play a role in your everyday life. So that's why I'm here today is to explain to you what this gravity thing is that we all talk about. So let me start by what is a force? So a force is um, something that causes an object to move. So a force has both a mass and an acceleration. And when you apply a force on something, it's gonna move faster or slower based on the mass and the acceleration that you're applying on it. So that's what a force is. And there are four fundamental forces in nature. We have the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the gravitational force. And I'm bringing this up because the gravitational force is actually the weakest force of all. So it being the weakest force, why is it so important? It plays a role in our daily lives. It's the reason that things are not falling apart around us. It literally keeps us grounded to the earth. Um, so it's the reason that the planets take the traje trajectories that they take. It's the reason that you're able to have, say, like a living room and things aren't floating about and they're just still. So all of these have to do with gravity. So it's really important in our daily lives because it actually allows us to have an atmosphere and a comfortable weather. So, and it's also the reason we're not flying out in space. So why aren't we falling into space? So let's think about a little thought experiment here. So um, great scientists in our past, like Sir Isaac Newton, like Albert Einstein, they all um, had these thought experiments. And one of those was when Sir Isaac Newton saw an apple fall from a tree, he thought, is this similar to how the moon falls towards the earth? Or why isn't the moon falling towards the earth? So these are some of the things that he thought about. And so I'm gonna start with a little bit of history. Um, so Galileo, there's a lot of scientists that um, kind of like started uh, bringing the puzzles into this big theory of what gravity is. But Galileo tested the gravitational effects on earth. So he actually um, found that if you drop a mass, so any object from any height, it's gonna accelerate uh, it's going to have a given acceleration, and that's going to be independent of mass. So mass isn't going to affect whether that object falls faster or slower. And so then came Sir Isaac Newton, cheers, and then he established the law of universal gravitation, or N-lug, as I learned recently. I love that word, N-lug. So this was in the late 1600s. Um, so he discovered this proportionality between the force of gravity and masses. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later. And then came Einstein and he established the theory of general relativity in the early 1900s. So this was another piece to this puzzle of understanding what gravity is. So I explained the force and I told you a little bit of history, but what is gravity? And in the words of Neil deGrasse Tyson himself, we have absolutely no idea, and I hope you're not disappointed with this, but I can explain what it does. So fundamentally, we don't know what gravity is. We can describe it, we can use physics laws to understand it, but we don't know what it is. But gravity explained by n log. And you're looking at an equation, and I hope you're not intimidated, but I'm gonna break it down for you. So, the force of gravity is determined by four things. 
you have a mass one and you have a mass two. And these two things are proportional to the force of gravity. So what does this mean? It means that if you have a larger mass, you're gonna have a larger force of gravity. So each of the masses, the heavier they are, um, the larger the force between them. And it's also determined by this distance squared. So um, the distance squared, this is an, also known as the inverse square law because it means that the more distant that objects are, um, the weaker the force of gravity is gonna be. So if you're like really, really far from the sun, you're not gonna be feeling that force of gravity. And if you're really far from the earth, you're also not gonna fall towards it. So that's what this inverse square law is doing. And it also is determined by this gravitational constant G that is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. So this is a very, very tiny number. There are 11 zeros after this decimal. And so this is a very weak force, or I'm sorry, a very weak constant. Um, and that's why you need very large masses um, in order to actually determine like a real force in between them. But that's not to say that you can't um, actually calculate the force of gravity between any two objects because you can. And in my, in my view, and why one of the reasons why I love gravity so much is because n lug is romantic. So that means that any two bodies, whether that be human bodies or celestial bodies, will have a force of gravity acting between them. And you are actually attracted to each other and you can actually measure this. So next time you're with your partner, you can say, I'm so gravitationally attracted to you. And that I think is very romantic, even though that force of attraction is gonna be equal to the weight of a piece of paper, doesn't matter, you can still measure it. So there is a problem with n -lug. It does not explain why gravity exists and we need a different explanation since, such as Einstein's theory of general relativity to explain this. So let me explain a little bit more about the theory of general relativity. So you can imagine space as, have, as being a fabric and this is called space-time. And it's a fourth dimensional fabric. So it has space and time. And what's happening here is that if you have a mass, that is actually gonna curve the space-time. So it's gonna curve that fabric that you see here. And the more massive that object is, the greater the curvature of space-time. So that's um, in a nutshell what the uh, fabric of space-time is doing based on different masses. So if you look at these masses, you can see that as the masses get greater, like this red ball is just making a little dimple. And then this um, bright orange, I mean, bright yellow ball is making a bigger curve and that's because it's more massive. And so that means that objects, when they're falling towards it, they're gonna go faster based on the mass. So that's what um, the theory of general relativity is explaining. And so I really like this quote by John Wheeler which it says, mass tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells mass how to move. So what is this saying? Like I was saying before, that the more massive an object is, it's gonna tell this fabric of space-time how deep it's gonna go. And then space-time is gonna tell any mass around it how fast it's gonna go or how fast it's accelerating. And something that I, li I like to make an analogy here in which if you're ever sitting on a couch with another person and you're like the lighter person or the heavier person, the lighter person's always gonna go towards the heavier person because the heavier person is actually acting on that couch or on that bed. And the lighter person's gonna like start gravitation, being gravitationally attracted to the smaller person. So it's not always because the small people are clingy, it's because there's literally um, something happening in that sheet that you can compare it to the sheet of, of space time. So I think that's a really cool analogy. So let's think about an example of gravity on the moon. Um, now that we're thinking about how fast um, objects are falling towards um, in another massive object. So the um, acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.81 um, meters per second squared. I almost forgot that number. 9.81 meters per second squared. And on the moon, it's 1.62. So it's a lot smaller because the moon is a lot smaller. And remember this proportionality, right? So the moon is smaller, the earth is bigger. So what that means is that the acceleration is gonna be smaller. So you're not gonna be moving as fast. 
So if you think about the movies that you've seen in which people are kind of like slowly moving around the moon, that's because the acceleration due to gravity is 1.62, which is a lot smaller. So that's why you feel a lot heavier. And something that's also relevant is tides. So the moon going around the earth is gonna um, cause a gravitational pull on the earth. And even though it's not great, so it's not gonna affect the whole earth, but it does affect things like tides. So as the moon revolves around the earth, you're gonna get different tides due to that gravitational attraction. I think it's really cool to say gravitational attraction. Um, so that's one example. So that is not to say that we understand why the gravity in your bed at nine in the morning or at seven in the morning or at six in the morning, whatever time you wake up is so large that you cannot physically get out of it. So that is still a mystery to be discovered. Okay, so I've explained a little bit about how gravity works, but now I wanna give some examples to help you give, uh, get a better understanding of what it is. So um, this is an image of a black hole in which gravity is acting there because the black hole is so large that it's actually feeding off of the star. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. But let's talk about planetary motion and the orbits of stars. So with planetary motion, why it's so important when gravity is acting here is because planets are gravitationally bound to the sun. So what that means is that the gravity of the sun is very large, but um, planets are moving at such a speed that it's not um, great enough to leave the solar system, but it's not small enough to go towards the sun. So that is what we call gravitationally bound. And that's why we have a solar system. Solar system. So that's similar to when the sun goes around a galaxy, like um, all the stars that go around a galaxy. So I have an image here of the Andromeda galaxy. And this combination, this collection of stars that go around this center make up what we call a galaxy. And that center has a very large mass that is a black hole. So that's very important because we have stars, we have solar systems, and we have galaxies. And at larger scales, we also have galaxies going around each other. So the Andromeda galaxy, which is the closest massive galaxy to us, um, is actually orbiting around the Milky Way. And they're orbiting together. And soon their, their gravitational pull is so strong that they're actually going to merge. Um, and that's going to be an incredible event. We're not going to see it in our lifetimes. It's going to happen in like 4 billion years, but it's fine. So let me talk about another example that I like is gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are these ripples that are caused in space time. So these, um, these kind of like wave, literally waves that go around and these are due to very high energy events. So when you think about two black holes that are orbiting each other and they mash together, the energy is high enough for us to um, actually measure the gravitational wave that it's causing. Even though any acceleration um, any accelerating object is going to cause a gravitational, gravitational wave, but for us to be able to measure it, there has to be a giant energetic event. And that is what happened um, when we measured a gravitational wave in 2015, which was theorized in the early 1900s by Albert Einstein with his general theory of relativity. So he proved us right once again, even though we detected it 100 years later. But there is the existence of gravitational waves. So now I'm gonna talk about gravitational lensing, which I, is also part of Einstein's theory of relativity. So what's happening here is that a galaxy cluster, so a galaxy is a combination of stars. A galaxy cluster is a combination of galaxies. So there's a bunch of galaxies that are um, clustered together and their mass is so large that they're actually bending the space time around them in which if you have an object behind it, like you can see in this image, the light that follows that path is gonna get distorted by the space time around it. So it's gonna go around in a curve like so. And then you get images like this, and that light is actually magnified. So you can study objects that are further away based on this distortion of space time and the light that deviates the path around the galaxy cluster, isn't that? freaking awesome, like we're actually seeing it happen, even though it was theorized like 100 years ago. And so um, this is another example of Einstein's ring. And why is this so important to astronomers? 
not only it gives us a better understanding of how space time works, but also we're able to study the, the light coming from that object, that distant object, and it acts as like a telescope because it's magnifying that light. So it gives us a chance to study far away objects that we wouldn't be able to see with our um, telescopes that we have. So you can actually try gravitational lensing at, at home. So if you haven't finished your wine already, um, you can try this with your wine glass and you can shine a light through it and you can see how the light is being bent around um, that curvature. And that's what gravitational lensing is doing. And okay, so this leads me to my, my last example, which is my favorite, my personal favorite, which is black holes. So black holes are incredibly dense and compact objects. So um, I have an example here of the sun and a neutron star, which a neutron star is a lot more dense than a star. And then we have a black hole. And a black hole, as you can see, curves space-time so much because it's so dense and it's so massive. And it's, um, so it's gravitation, that means that its gravitational pull is gonna be so large that the fastest thing in the universe, which is the speed of light, cannot escape. So what does that mean is that um, there is an escape velocity in which you need to leave the gravitational pull of an object. So the fastest thing in the universe was, in the universe, which is light, can't escape. So there is a point of no return. So don't try to go in a black hole. You're not going to be able to get out. Um, but that is what's happening in a black hole. And there's two types of black holes. There's stellar black holes, um, which are uh, happen because, uh, because of a death of a star. So when a star collapses, it cannot... Um, contain its gravitational um, pull. So it just kind of like collapses into a black hole. And so um, the matter uh, around it, we can actually study that because that black hole is so, um, so dense that it's gonna cause all the matter around it to go really, really fast and spit out really high energy photons. Um, so we can actually study those. And this usually happens in binary star systems because it's actually, like you see in this image, it's actually feeding off, like the gravitational pull is feeding off of that star and causing this accretion disk around the black hole. So that's what a stellar black hole is doing. But then there's super massive black holes. And just like their names, they're super massive. And they're theorized to be at the center of every galaxy. And so this image is taken, um, you're looking at a bunch of stars in our Milky Way galaxy, a bunch of stars that are orbiting around the center. But do you see that star in the middle? That's actually not a star, there's nothing there. So as physicists and astronomers, we know that something that's orbiting around something else, there has to be a mass responsible for the velocity of these stars. And when you measure these, um, the mass, you find not only a huge amount of mass, but um, you actually don't find any light escaping. So that's where the discovery of supermassive black holes came from. So then you also can see, you can study these not only in our own galaxy, but because they're theorized in all galaxies, you can see these in galaxies like M87, which was the first ever picture taken of a black hole about um, a year ago. And um, you can, what's like really cool about this is that uh, we don't actually know where supermassive black holes came from. Um, so this is still a mystery to astronomers and that's why I study what I do and why I love it so much is because we're still trying to find out what is going on with the galaxy and the supermassive black hole that has like such a huge gravitational attraction that it can actually keep a galaxy together. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I hope that I have convinced you that gravity is really cool and it's really important. And also um, that you understand that the force of gravity, most importantly, is described by any two objects with a mass and the distance between them matters. And um, black holes are the coolest. No, I'm kidding. But, um, but hopefully I gave you a better understanding of like why it's so important in our universe, how it can be applied. And when you jump, when you throw a ball, you'll be able to understand what gravity is doing and how you can describe it. And thank you. I'll take questions now. I hope I didn't go over time. I have no idea. All right. 
great job, Sylvie. Great talk. You didn't Thanks. go over time. That was perfect. Oh, awesome. um, was like we so do good. have some questions. We have we have a couple audience questions here. So okay. first question is from Robert Burroughs. Um, can they make an undistorted image from a gravitational lens image? Um, yes, I think so. Um, I've never done, like, I've, I don't study this and I don't study gravitational lensing, but we do run simulations um, as astronomers in which we can actually try to mimic what the universe is doing. So we can definitely try to make like a fake galaxy and a fake galaxy behind it and try to understand. Um, so that's, that's actually part of a, a field of astronomy. And if you're interested, we should go into it. Yeah. Good answer. Um, next question is from Mark Fox and it is, will wormholes have gravity? Um, so will wormholes have gravity? I'm not really sure what's happening inside of a wormhole, but if you're going as a person with a mass, uh, then yeah, there must be gravity acting there because that is the fundamental. It's like a particle exists, there's gravity. So if we ever get to what a wormhole is, then, um, then it must play a part in, in the physical uh, laws that make it, yeah. Awesome. And then last question is from Alex Riley. Uh, and it is, what is your favorite black hole? Oh, come on. <laughs> you guys know this. So my favorite black hole has to be Home 15A. And I'm just going to talk about it a little bit, but I'm, I'm actually studying that black hole right now. And it's um, a nearby black hole, nearby in quotation, because it's actually really far. Um, but it's, it's one of the it has one of the largest black hole masses known um, in the nearby in nearby galaxy. So it's 40 billion solar masses. So it's huge. Um, so that that's what we study is trying to measure that mass. And that's definitely what my favorite black hole is. Yeah. All right. Awesome. I don't see any more questions uh, being thrown at me. So I think that's it. Thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. Um, yeah, you. great job. Thank you for having me. Bye, guys. All righty. Thanks again, Sylvie. I definitely played your drinking game wrong because I still have some beer left here. Uh, before moving on, a reminder that if you'd like to take part in our trivia, just go to the link on your, that you see on your screen. That's tx.ag slash AOT trivia. Um, this month happens to also be National Poetry Month. So that is the theme of our quiz. If you answer a lot of them correctly, you may win a prize. And this month we're actually doing something special. We're also gonna be picking a winner at random. So hop on over to that form, leave your email if you would like to shoot your shot at winning a prize. And we will announce winners not in this stream. Again, uh, if you'd like to stay up to date on what we're doing, the links to our social media are in the description along with a tip jar for our usual venue, the Grand Stafford Theater. Now, next up, we have a regular at our AOT, Yaswan Thevarakonda with What's Up? Hey, thanks for having me. So let's talk about what's up in the sky this month. Let me see if I can pull it up. All right. So for the April 2020 edition of What's Up, I split it into three different categories. First up, we've got the easy mode things. So these are things like the planets and the moon. Um, these are things you can observe with your naked eye really easily, or if you have a cheap pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you can see them from basically anywhere. If you wanna look at Mercury, you're gonna to wanna to look up just before sunrise right in the east, because Mercury's been into your planets, so it'll be close to the sun at all times. If you wanna look at Venus, you're actually gonna look at right after sunset in the west. How, now, one, one, uh, Cool thing to look at though this month is Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which are all up in the early morning, really close to each other. You just gotta look right up in the southeast. And if you actually go tomorrow morning, right about say 5 a.m., you'll see the moon, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter all kind of in a row together, like you see in this image over here, which would make a really great viewing opportunity. Next up, we've got the medium mode observations. And so for this, we have the Lyriad moon sh meteor showers. So about every April, the comet Thatcher comes by the Earth and deposits a whole bunch of meteors on us. 
This meteor shower technically goes from April 16th to the 28th, but it peaks around the 22nd. If you want to watch the meteor shower, look near the star of Vega, which is going to be high in the east between the hours of midnight and dawn. Uh, particularly if you look next Wednesday, I believe it's the 23rd, that's probably the best time to start looking. You'll see about 10 meters an hour, but they'll be pretty easy to see by the naked eye, which is why I made this as a medium mode. You can see this by the naked eye, but you got to be up early, early in the morning, and you got to be staring up at the sky for a long time before you see anything. But you can pretty much see these from anywhere. Next up, we've got the hard mode observation. So this is going to require a little more investment on your part and a little more trekking around to the countryside. The common atlas comes by the Earth, and the closest approach is going to be in May. Around that time, it will likely be visible with, by the naked eye, assuming you're out in a sufficiently dark site. But if you're not, in April, you should be able to see it with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. This weekend is a good opportunity to try to look for it, because it will be pretty close to the new moon, so there won't be a lot of moonlight uh, blocking your view. And that is what's up. All right, next up, we have Alex Riley with In the News. But before we jump into that, um, just really quickly, I want to remind everyone, please go ahead and head over to trivia, um, text.ag slash AOT trivia. And we will announce the winner, or we won't announce the winners at the end, but we will go over the trivia answers at the end, and we will contact winners uh, via email afterward. Um, and next up, we have Alex Riley with Astronomy in the News. What? Woo! Yes, excellent. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen and let's get started. Okay, so this is in the news for your April 2020 on the couch edition. Um, so let's just get started uh, if it gets me ready. Okay, cool. So astronomers keep laying Starlinked. Um, if you haven't heard of this story yet, um, the idea here is that um, our, you know, evil overlord from a James Bond film, um, Elon Musk, has decided to use his, his company SpaceX to launch a whole bunch of satellites into the sky um, in order to give universal internet access to everybody, which is fine, except for the fact that he, that uh, Starlink, this constellation of satellites, is basically a whole bunch of tiny disco balls in space, um, which means that they give off a lot of light. And well, they don't give off a lot of light, they reflect light from the sun. And so if you point a telescope at these things, they make these big streaks along our images and that sucks. We don't like it. They're uh, a, a, a typical image that's, ta that's taken by um, a moderately large telescope could lose anywhere from 15 to 20% of an exposure to these things that are flying around um, that have kind of become the bane of astronomers existence. Um, so the latest on this, the, la the, la the latest update updates, uh, there's two. One is that DarkSat, which is, uh, so, so astronomers complained when this started happening, when we started seeing streaks in our, uh, in, in our astronomical images. Uh, we complained to SpaceX and a whole bunch of other people. And SpaceX listened to us and he's like, okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to fix this. We're, go we're going to, um, essentially, they decided to paint their, satellites black. And so the first time that, they, that the, the test trial um, happened and it's in, it's in the sky right now, they're calling it dark set. And it is fainter about, it went from seven and a half magnitudes to about six, from six and a half to about seven and a half, which is about 55% fainter, which sounds pretty good until you think about the fact that astronomers really are, for the most part, are doing a lot of science that's way fainter than that. So we're talking 20th. 25th magnitude, um, many, many thousands of times fainter. And so it's just not enough. And it was kind of comical uh, when, when we saw this. It's like, yep, okay, not enough. You got, got to do a little bit, a little bit better, Elon. Um, next up, uh, the FCC authorized SpaceX to roll out up to 1 million ground antennae. Um, basically, so the ground antenna for the Starlink, for the Starlink constellations are, are to connect your phone to the, the satellites that are orbit, that are flying around Earth. Um, and so astronomers complained to the FCC originally uh, to try and get SpaceX to back off of this project. And the fact that the FCC authorized SpaceX to do this means that they probably aren't listening to us a whole lot. 
Uh, so that's great. Better, happier news. Um, NASA fixes a problem by literally hitting it with a shovel. Um, so the backstory here is that the um, the Mars Insight rover that's on that's on Mars right now, um, it's meant to uh, basically take a whole bunch bunch of different types of data, but one of them is to inject a heat probe that's going to bury itself up to 16 feet into Mars's surface. And since you're measuring heat that deep, it's going to measure basically the temperature on, on Mars, uh, the temperature gradients, and, and that'll help us figure out how rocky planets form, basically. The problem is that the lack, the lack of friction where they're trying to put the heat probe in um, is preventing the probe from burrowing in. So you have to, so for this heat probe, you have to set it up on the ground and then it basically hammers itself in. And we're having a little bit of trouble setting it up in, in, initially. And so we haven't been able, to, it hasn't been able to hammer itself in yet. Um, and the solution that NASA, came, that the brilliant scientists that NASA came up with um, was basically to have insight, kind of give it a little push with its robotic arm, which is code for, since the robot, the end of the robotic arm is a shovel, is basically to just push it in with a shovel until it's ready to go. Um, this is a fantastic story. If you're on Twitter, there's a hashtag save the mole where they where the, where NASA uh, it, the inside rover cat cataloged every, everything that was going going on in tweets. Um, that's pretty great. It was a fun read. Um, right. Okay. So going a little bit further, now we're outside of our solar system. Um, there is an exoplanet where we think iron rain falls on that exoplanet. And it does it in a really cool way. So I'm talking about WASP-76b, which is a, a Jupiter-ish sized planet. So pretty big ga gas giant, um, 640 light years away in the Pisces constellation, but it's very hot. And we know this because it's orbiting very close to the sun. It has a, p it, its year is 1.8 days. So orbiting very close to its star, which makes it a hot Jupiter. Um, but the interesting thing about it, about this planet, is that it's tidally locked. So just like how um, the moon is rotating as fast as it's going around Earth so that we always see the same side of the moon, same thing is happening on this planet Watch 76 b there's a, there's a day side and there's a night side, and that's always the case. Um, the day side is 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the night side is a balmy 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, the deal here is that sci scientists use uh, spectroscopy to figure out, okay, we're measuring iron. Uh, we're, we're, fi we're finding signature signatures of iron um, on the, the transition from the day to the night side, but not on the night to the day side. And the, wh what that means basically is that, is that there's iron rain falling on an exoplanet uh, so the so the idea here is that uh, as iron iron gets heated up on on the day side gets really hot um, evap evaporates and then winds carry it over to over to the cooler night side where it then falls down as rain. That's and that's the first time that we've seen like a change in chemical signature of an exoplanet before. That's really cool. Okay. Uh, even farther away now, so now we're outside of our own galaxy, way, way, way far into the universe. Um, the, we have truly looked at the belly of the beast. And by the beast, I mean a uh, active galactic nucleus. So Blazar 3C279 is a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy uh, halfway across the universe. And the idea here is that it's because it's an active galactic nucleus, uh, the supermassive black hole is basically accelerating a whole bunch of relief of, of particles and shooting them in a big ray outside, outside of it. And that ray is almost pointed directly at us. Uh, it's about two degrees offset in the sky. So not, not, not a lot, it's pointed almost directly at us. And so, so it has all these uh, gamma ray and X-ray signatures and it's very bright in the sky in gamma and X-ray. Um, and so the Event Horizon Telescope, who are the ones who over a year, just over a year ago, took that really nice picture of the center of a black hole, they pointed their the, uh, many radio dishes scattered around the globe, all at this beast, um, all at this point in the sky, and stared at it for 
four days over the course of a week. Um, and that was with the Event Horizon Telescope again. And so what they found was very interesting. Was very interesting. This is from so the the bottom right image here. Uh, the left is from Chandra X ray, really zoom basically zoomed out far away. You see the jet in that corner, and then if you zoom really close in, that's where the Event Horizon te Telescope is looking. So that central blob in the in the top right, that's the blob that's very close to where we think the black hole is, and then the lower right blob is the jet basically or we're seeing radio emission radio emission coming from a blob of jet material um and what's really cool is that the resolution for the event horizon telescope so for context this the event horizon telescope if you set it up on earth uh it could read the news a newspaper that someone had folded up in paris from new york like read the font that's how good of a telescope this is um and so this this amazing instrument stared across halfway of the universe and watched this rate this blob of radio jet move over the course of a week that's completely wild and so cool that they did this um so okay last uh last story here this is more of an interest story um hubble is turning 30 which is great uh we probably should do some sort of a hubble related event next month. Um, so they, to celebrate, NASA made kind of like a birthday calendar thing. So uh, the idea here is that if you, if you, uh, the web, the website link is, is kind of long. And so if you just, if you just Google like Hubble birthday, it'll, it'll pop up. Um, so basically help uh, NASA put up this uh, web repository thing where you can select your birth date. So I put in April 15th because that's today. And they give you a picture that Hubble has taken on your birthday, not necessarily the day you were born, but, but like on your birthday some, sometime in the past 30 years. Uh, and they give you a absolutely beautiful picture um, and then a little small description of what's going on. And then you can click and see the full image or you can click for more info if you wanna, if you wanna hear more. Uh, this is just cool. And I wanted to include this at the end. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's the astronomy in the news. All righty. Thanks, Alex. The iron rain on that exoplanet is, dare I say, very metal. <laughs> Anyhow. <Yeah. laughs> you, do, you do dare say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, puns aside, um, last call for trivia. The link is in the description. It's tx.ag slash AOT trivia. Again, it's in the description along with the tip jar for our usual venue, the Grand Stafford Theater. Remember to always tip your bartender. Alrighty, and now for our second talk of the evening, we have Yaswanth Devarkonda again, AKA the Cosmic Kid. Yaswanth is an 18th grader who is one homework assignment away from never taking another class in his life. Good on you, sir. When he isn't learning about the mysteries of the universe, he's usually drinking too much, glued to some sort of screen, and trying to make his dog into a social media influencer. And speaking of social media, if you'd like to follow him on Twitter, his handle is YAstronomy. All lowercase, no spaces, just YAstronomy. And it's over to you, Yaswant. Oh, hey there, you cool cats and kittens. Didn't see you there. I guess it's about time for my talk. All right. Why don't we talk about Mars, the red planet, the coolest planet? Don't worry, this talk's not going to have any boring nerd stuff like math. We're going to talk about cool stuff, like the Soviet Union and the US in the Cold War, and explosions. So first of all, you know, for hundreds of years, people have asked the question, what's on Mars? Early astronomers saw what they thought were canals on the surface stretching across the planet, proof of an advanced civilization capable of great feats of engineering and a planet full of water and life. While these canals were optical illusions, as it turned out, these rumors inspired many great works of science fiction. The first half of the 20th century was filled with so many great works, imagining all sorts of great civilizations that could be out there. 
Homo salvage were technologically superior, but morally inferior to us humans. Perhaps the most famous of these was H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, originally published in 1898 and made famous by the 1938 radio adaptation. It caused widespread panic as listeners confused it with the real news broadcast. This dream of a lush and advanced Mars came crashing to a halt, however, in 1965, with the Mariner 4 spacecraft flew by Mars, revealing that there were no canals filled with water or great alien cities. Instead, it showed for the first time a barren, lifeless rock filled with craters and an extremely thin atmosphere. While we were safe from any Martian invasion, the scene was set for another type of invasion, that of our robots on Mars. In the height of the space race, the United States and the Soviet Union were competing to be the first to explore several parts of the solar system. Two Soviet probes came the first to contact the surface in 1971. The Mars 2 lander failed during the descent, but technically it was the first piece of, of, of human space junk to actually make contact with Mars. The Mars 3 rover failed about 20 seconds after landing, but it did technically land and it did manage to send out a partial image, although no one's been able to figure out just what that image means. The US had the successful flyby of Mariner 4, of course, and in 1971, it had more success with the Mariner 9, the first probe to orbit another planet. The first successful landing took place in 1976 with the American spiking one and two landers, which showed the world the first color panorama pictures of the Martian surface. The next successful mission wouldn't be until 1996, however, as Mars proved to be a exceptionally different, difficult target to explore. Many failed at launch, particularly in the early days of the space race when technology was still untested. Others struggled with a thin atmosphere and rough terrain. One of the other big issues, of course, is that the launch window to Mars is quite a long time. Earth and Mars are both orbiting the sun, so you have to wait a while before the distance between Earth and Mars is close enough that you can launch a rocket with, with sufficient efficiency. This launch window occurs roughly every two years and two months. One of the most famous examples of a failure is the 1999 Mars Climate Orbiter. One team of the engineers working on the project used the metric system, such as meters and kilometers, while the other used empirical units, American units, such as feet and miles. This ended up causing the $193 million spacecraft to go on the wrong trajectory and burn up in the atmosphere instead of orbiting Mars. As another example, the ESA's Schiaparelli lander crashed just a few years ago in 2016, when its sensors overloaded during the descent. The craft ended up thinking it was somewhere underground when it was really a few miles in the air. So it ejected its parachute early and fired its landing thrusters for only a few seconds. Its companion, the Trace Gas Orbiter, was able to measure its descent and relay this to the scientists back on Earth. So the scientists could watch in real time as the lander hit the Martian surface at 340 miles an hour. The very next day, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was able to image the crash site, showing a burnt out crater where the lander should have been. Things have gotten better since, however, as technology improved and international cooperation improved as well. The 1996 Sojourner mission became the first successful rover on Mars, operating for full 84 days. Then in 2003, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers would begin what was supposed to be a 90-day mission. Spirit would go on to operate for six and a half years before it got stuck in a trench and ended up dying out there. Opportunity managed to last over 15 years. It wasn't until a dust storm covered its entire solar panels that, that caused it to die. And in February 2019, just last year, NASA announced that Opportunity's mission was complete. This last message, somewhat poetically, was somewhere along the lines of, my batteries die and it's getting dark. The last decade has had several more Mars missions, perhaps the most famous of which was the 2012 landing of the Curiosity rover, a SUV-sized rover that landed via Skycrane. Now, if you don't remember what the, what the landing was like, or if you don't know what Skycrane is, basically imagine a 
crane platform that is held up in the air by rockets, gently lowering a SUV-sized robot onto the surface of an alien planet. For 16-year-old Yaswan, watching the live stream of the landing at 1 a.m. on a school night, it was the coolest shit he'd ever seen. In 2013, the Indian Space Research Organization became the fourth ever organization to have a successful Mars mission with their Mongolian orbiter. It was also the only nation to succeed on their very first try. Fun fact, the entire mission cost about $70 million. The movie The Martian, starring Mark Wahlberg, cost over $100 million to make, and about the same to promote. In 2018, NASA had two successful missions. The Inside Lander, which you've heard about earlier, would drill about 16 feet into the surface to monitor Martian seismic activity. The Mars Cube 1 flyby, which also flew along with InSight, consisted of two CubeSats, which were the very first to operate outside of Earth's orbit, pioneering a new frontier of space exploration. The future of Mars exploration is quite bright. In July of this year, the Perseverance rover will launch. This is somewhat of a follow-up to Curiosity. In fact, Curiosity was built as was somewhat of a template for Perseverance. Along with Perseverance is a small helicopter drone that will be the first flying explorer of another world. And it is an important test for future missions, such as the Dragonfly mission to Titan. The next five years, we'll also see launches from the United States, the EU, Russia, and India, as they try to build on their previous work. China, Japan, and the United Arab Emirates are also planning to launch their very first successful Mars missions. China and Japan had tried earlier, but weren't able to land successfully, while the UAE is trying to succeed on their very first try, much as India has. Private space companies, such as SpaceX, also have their own missions planned, ushering a new era of Mars exploration. They're planning for a test launch in 2020 and a possible crewed launch in 2024. They've already sent one test payload, a Tesla Roadster with a mock astronaut. It has since flown by Mars just as planned, and it gave us this iconic image as it left Earth. If only going to Mars was as simple as cruising in your car. And with that, I'll end and take any questions you might have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Cosmic Kid. Um, I don't believe you have any questions in the chat, but I have a question. What is your aesthetic? Uh, I guess beach? That's where <laughs> I imagine myself right now. Don't we all? <laughs> Alrighty, if we've got no questions, thank you very much. I think we have one question. Oh, we do? Yeah. Oh, we do? Whoops, my bad. Ah, this question comes from my fellow MC, 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 MC. What was the best Mars mission? You know, I'm very partial to curiosity. Um, part of that is just because it was a formative part of my childhood. Um, part of that is that it is just an amazing, amazing feat of engineering to land a SUV-sized robot on Mars, a planet where less than 50% of missions are successful, via freaking sky <laughs> That That makes a lot of sense. Not that I was asked, but I think mine is curiosity, just because I was also a kid when it launched, and it has a place in my heart. In all of our hearts. <laughs> All righty. Thank you, Yaswan. Thanks for having me. Okay. Hello there, MCMC. MC. MC. Hi, MC <laughs> <laughs> um, and now to round out the evening, we're going to go through the trivia answers. If I can get it open. <laughs> And here we go. Okay, so yes, since it is National Poetry Month, the theme of this month's trivia is poetry. The aim of the game was to guess the astronomy thing from the given verse that may or may not rhyme and which may or may not have been written by me. Anyhow, so the first verse was dimmed in December, doomed to die likely soon, red supergiant, and the answer is Beetlejuice. And I'm not gonna say it three times because we don't have time for that. Next, knock on wood or it'll not launch. 
long time for infrared eyes on the sky? And the answer to this one is the James Webb Space Telescope, which fingers crossed, knock on wood, <laughs> will launch sometime next year, please. Number three, shooting stars are its calling card. The sun provides a striking tail. It's no fun. And the answer to this one is Comet, much like the ones that will be shooting through the sky this month, as we heard in What's Up. Verse four, constant it is not, but constantly disputed. Distances and speeds. Now, if you're in the loop about astronomy, you may have heard, guessed this one correctly. It is the Hubble constant that is somewhere between 67 to 73 kilo kilometers per second per megaparsec. That doesn't seem like a large range, but it is a huge deal for astronomers. Just like if you want to start an astronomy fight, just throw the Hubble constant out there. <laughs> Five, monasteries and fine beer, an exoplanet finder, I say cheers. This one is Trappist. So Trappists are monks who make beer. And it's also the name of an exoplanet finding observatory that found that really cool system with seven planets orbiting it. Question six. If you're paying attention, Yaz once talks, you'll know what this is. Populated by robots, held a place in H.G. Wells' thoughts. It is Mars. <laughs> Question seven. You had the power to be unseen, but had to pull your weight. And now searchers with eyes keen look for you in space. The answer to this one is dark matter that exerts gravity, like you heard in Sylvie's talk. Question eight, dog star, brightest star, white dwarf companion. The Nile is flooding. Now, if you know what the brightest star is, we have this one already. It's Sirius, which also rose around the time that the Nile would flood in ancient Egypt. Question nine, princess in the sky heading straight for us. Why? The result, starry sphere. Now, if you know your Greek mythology, you'll know that this one is the Andromeda galaxy, which is one of the few things in the universe that is heading straight for us. And it'll collide with the Milky Way and turn us into this big orange blob of stars. Fortunately, we'll be long gone by then. And the last question. Twins in the sky and on the ground. One set watches as the other spins round. The answer to this one is Gemini and Gemini. So both. Well, you, for one, you have the constellation referring to the twins. And the other Gemini is a set of two observatories, one in the Northern Hemisphere in Hawaii and the other in Chile. Alrighty, so we're gonna have two winners for trivia. One, if you got all the answers or at least a lot of the answers, right? And the other winner will be choosing at random. And now I'm gonna turn, bring us back to the land with MCM33 and MCMCMC. Yes, um, that's pretty much it for our show today. Thank you all for watching. I'm going to plug a few more things really quickly. Um, this is just a reminder to please follow us on social media. Um, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram at AOTBCS. There's an official site that should have some info about when our events are going to be as well. Um, I, Please also check out these, all these links are also in the description of this YouTube video. Um, please like and subscribe our YouTube video, our YouTube channel that we have now. Uh, we feel very official and proud to have it. This is great. Um, thank you for coming out to our first ever live streamed Astronomy on Tap. Um, please also help support the wonderful, amazing, fantastic venue and the people who work there that usually uh, support us, but can't right now. Um, it's the Grand Stafford Theater what? in um, Bryan, Texas. Yeah, woo! Um, you can support them. You can tip your bartender tonight, uh, which is them, because we say so. Uh, you can you can tip them by uh, donating at this uh, Venmo account um, and put Stafford tip in the description. Um, Jose Quintana uh, twenty is the Venmo account. 
You can also donate to us and help support us directly on Venmo or the Cash App with AOT BCS. Um, and our next event is going to be May 20th, 2020, uh, next month, third Wednesday of the month. Come see us then. We will be here. We will be live. We will have a whole new set of talks and interesting astronomy facts to throw at you. That's all for me. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.